welcome everyone to our skill up session today with Emily Springer. My name is Jenna Johnson and I am an academic learning specialist with the Academic Training Academy. I just want to cover a few housekeeping items before I hand it on over to Emily. We are recording our time together today and that video will be posted to our center in the skill ups page within 24 hours. Um, you can use the Q&A forum to um, ask any questions that you have, or you can post them in the chat. Um, we're going to be monitoring the chat, but sometimes if there's a little too much activity, things can get lost, so you may want to use Q&A. Uh, we do have scrolling subtitles enabled, and you can turn these on by hovering over the bottom of your Zoom window to see your controls. Uh -huh. Click the CC option and show subtitles. You can turn these off at any time. And with that, I'm gonna turn it on over to Emily. Thank you so much, Jenna. And um, it's absolutely a joy to be here today with you all. Thanks for those of you who have joined on today's call and thank you to all the participants who registered for today's session. My name is Emily Springer. I am an academic learning specialist at National University. And if you've attended our skill up sessions in the past, you know that I have been someone who has facilitated our sessions. I help promote them. I help process our videos so that our students can access them at a time that's convenient for them. And that's just one tiny sliver of what I do at NU. I look forward to presenting today's session and engaging with you in today's skill up on packing dispositions, empowering strategies for adult learners. Before we get going into, the, into today's session, I'd like to get to know a little bit about who is in the room today. And I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. So if you are willing and able, I know some people are joining us from the car. Please do not participate <laughs> if you are doing that. I'm going to launch just a quick poll. Uh, we do have class-based students, one-to-one -one students at NU. And I know some faculty and staff are on the call. And some folks from outside of NU have joined us today. So I just wanted to kind of learn a little bit more about who's in the room It'll help guide our conversation. And I'll wait just a second more while you engage. <laughs> we'll go ahead and end the poll here. So it looks like we're actually uh, about 50% of the room is in our one-to-one -one model. We have about 30% joining us uh, from our class base and uh, about 20% or so are faculty and staff. And it looks like the majority of the room are master's and doctoral students. So thank you so much for participating in that poll. Little bit about me. <laughs> I think it's fair that I share just a little bit about who I am, tell you a little bit about the onion here, peel back some of the layers, especially since we're going to be unpacking dispositions. So this is not all of me, but what I want to share today is I am a mom of two girls. I am a wife of 14 years, happily married to a public administrator in K-12 education, who has, by the way, just completed his educational specialist degree from National University, bravo, in educational leadership. And I'm a doctoral candidate. I'm inching closer to the IRB process, and I'm currently doing my research on the experiences of belonging for adjunct faculty who teach remotely in higher education institutions. Of course, the findings of that research is for a completely different presentation, but stay tuned. I hope you'll join when I find out what the results are of that qualitative research. Couple of different things of my professional uh, positions that I have served as a public school educator. I have been an adjunct faculty member at several institutions. I've also had the joy of being a president of a small nonprofit organization, which was a very fulfilling part of my life. I've always been involved with education in one way or another. And in higher ed, whether it was in advising or training and development for over a decade now, what has always been true about most everything I do in my professional positions is my passion to see students succeed. Absolutely. 
I think it's fair to share a little bit about myself because I'm hoping that you'll engage in some self-reflection to boost whatever it is that you need at the moment as an adult learner. Because let's be real, adult learning is no joke. It is hard. <laughs> and I believe that if we could spend some time unpacking some dispositions and explore some empowering strategies that might help you in those times where you need to turn in that midnight assignment or you need to handle that feedback that maybe you weren't quite expecting or anticipating, or dare I say, even plan ahead as an adult learner. So with that, I'll move us to our agenda. What are we talking about today? We are going to discuss some dispositions for adult learners. I specifically chose four to kind of mull around in our brains and talk about some strategies for today. And we're gonna go ahead and discuss some practical strategies that will help encourage or support these dispositions. I definitely provide some real world examples that demonstrate successful application and then what I want to make sure is that if you are willing and able, you can create an action plan. Pulling from some of these dispositions that we discussed today, um, maybe some strategies that will help you and transform your adult learning experience, or maybe just be that boost that you need right now in your master's or your doctorate program. So I do invite you, if you have pen and paper, you're welcome to bring that out, or if you'd prefer to open up a Word doc, you can go right ahead. Or if today you're just here to sit back and relax and think on these things, that's fine too. Um, I must give credit to some of the learning theories that I used and drew from as inspiration for today's session. Some of my humanist theories, those are theories centered on an individual's potential for self-actualization, self-direction, and internal motivation. I certainly looked at some andragogy, obviously, um, that is focused on the explanation of adult motivation and dispositions to learning. Ding, ding, ding. Dispositions to learning. What makes us move in that space? Self-directed learning. Adult learners, do you hear me out there? Self-directed learning, right? Suggestions on how we can conduct and assess our own learning. We are absolutely in the space of finding a prompt, uh, whether it's for our master's program or our doctoral. We have that prompt, we have that task, and then we are moving on into our own graces to find out the answers and problem solve for those research needs. What that brought me to was motivational models. I took a look at that. Uh, for example, the self-determination theory with Ryan and Desi. They examine and emphasize the idea of autonomy, relatedness, and competence. And then certainly reflective models. Um, one of the things that I've learned as a qualitative researcher is reflection can lead to change. And so I think that's an important piece to consider in this space. And because I have a very long love of uh, the CASEL framework for social emotional learning, certainly pulling from self-awareness, um, which has to do with obviously a cascade of, of elements as adult learners, relationship skills, social awareness, responsible decision-making and self-management skills. And so I know there's a lot to unpack here on this page with these theories and these models. Um, you could have absolutely entire semesters dedicated to just one of these pieces, but I've been inspired by these theories and these uh, frameworks to help create practical applications for the few dispositions we're gonna discuss today and try to provide some empowering strategies that I hope help you in your adult learner journey. And so without delay, Let's discuss the dispositions. So what are dispositions? <laughs> we know that they're not necessarily clearly defined. There are different ideas and scholars have written about them in different ways. I'm gonna go ahead and pop up three of them here that I took a, took a look at while I was considering the four dispositions I wanted to dis discuss today. And this, picture right here 
actually comes from um, a presentation I did at the Online Learning Consortium with Dr. Amy Lynn. And so this slide actually kind of inspired um, this entire presentation. And what I love about it is it shows this luggage. I'm going to say an adult learn adult learning is a journey. And you need to bring different things with you along the way. Of course, you can make an analogy to a tool belt, right? Different tools that you need. But I just, this speaks to me, something about the colors and the different sizes and everyone has different dispositions, like the luggage you bring on your journey, right? And I'm not referring to baggage because that's an entirely separate thing. And we all have that, right? Um, but in terms of luggage of like, being excited about going on this journey. And with learning, dispositions are characteristics or attitudes towards learning. They might be patterns or um, patterns of thinking, patterns of behaving or feeling. They are derived from our values, beliefs, and assumptions. And I thought that this picture might be inspiration to, if you will, go on this journey with me, that the luggage you bring on your journey, you can choose to pack or unpack whatever disposition you might need, considering the specific scenario. And I just thought this was a nice way to, to bring that idea in, into an image. Keep in mind that dispositions may drive behavior, but you must be willing, prepared, or inclined to use that talent, skill, or ability, right? Because you can have a skill and not use it. You have to want to use it. And so I'm hoping that you will engage with me and maybe put in the chat a few ideas that you have about dispositions. Maybe something that you have that is a skill or a talent as an adult learner. Maybe it's something that you're very proud of or maybe something that you'd like to work on as an adult learner. And so I invite you to come into the chat and mention some dispositions that you might need to have as an adult learner. I'm gonna get the ball rolling and I'll put in a few ideas. So don't be shy. And I can see organization. I, I put in with uh, one saying open-minded. Ooh, problem solving, improvisation, self-motivation. <laughs> yes, yes, Morgan, self-motivation, I understand. Growth mindset, absolutely. Yes, making the time, right? Time management. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Work efficient, efficiency. I put resilience in there too. Empathy as well. These are all great. I am going to move us forward so we can talk about our very first disposition. Today, I'm discussing curiosity, uh, self-efficacy, persistence, and re reflection. All right. First thing we're going to talk about, curiosity. <laughs> What drives us to pick up that key and put it in the keyhole and turn the lock and then push the door open and go through? The desire to know. The desire to know can actually be traced all the way back to Aristotle. And curiosity has actually been increasingly been regarded as one of the most important aspects of human behavior. Curiosity has often been defined as information seeking and exploration. Hello, adult learners. Do you hear that? We are curious by nature, and sometimes we need that spark um, to help keep us curious, especially in response to uncertainty and information gaps. So as adult learners, curiosity drives our desire to learn, explore, and understand new things. Curiosity gives us the satisfaction of personal growth, right? We become curious about something. We learn something new. There's some satisfaction for personal growth. A sense of accomplishment when we problem solve and other positive psychological benefits. But of course, curiosity isn't all rosy. <laughs> curiosity can be a big old bag of frustration or I don't want to deal with this right now because there are many other things going on. And so sometimes we need to find ways to motivate ourselves to be curious. I think we've all been deep in research in this room and we've said, I'm tired or I don't get this or uh, let me check my phone real quick and see what else I need to get done. And I think we've all been there. And so I wanted 
provide a story for you about what has helped me stay curious as an adult learner, and then discuss some strategies. So if if you're, this actually, this uh, specific situation has to do with my doctoral journey. And at the beginning of my process here, I had a, a tough time finding a research topic that I wanted to dedicate the next few years of my life to. <laughs> and uh, it was actually provided some great recommendation from someone that I value very much to take a look at some of the big topic items of what I was interested in, and then look at the end of those articles for suggestions for future re research. And then I, from there, I would actually have this breadcrumb trail where I could follow from previous researchers who had already laid some groundwork and then had shown, hey, here's the gap in the research. And that gap in the research, the breadcrumb trail that led to the gap in the research was actually what helped my curious disposition along the way. So I started to look at topics that interested me like SEL or wellness and belonging. And I took a look at some of those articles, looked at the suggestion for future research and being curious about what, what else needs to be done has actually sparked um, more of my curious disposition, which has led me to this great space where I'm in now, where I'm almost inching into the IRB process. So if you're in a space of trying to complete a master's uh, paper and you have to ha come up with this research topic or you're in your doctoral journey and you need a little spark <laughs> for your curious disposition, I recommend taking a look at some of those bigger topic items, flip the script, look at the bottom, of suggestions for future research. And maybe that'll spark some motivation to kind of dig deeper and be a little bit more curious in nature to find other resources on that specific topic of your interest. One more uh, piece to that, that I, I will also mention is in any research process, if you find an article that you are really connect with and sparks your interest in your curious nature, Take a look at those references at the end of those um, research papers, because that, again, is the little breadcrumb trail that has le been left from other researchers that has connections to what you're already interested in. So there you're you're collecting this, this these bits of gold along the way that lay a strong foundation for your research endeavors. Couple more strategies I want to share about helping with motivation for the um, curiosity disposition. These have come from the Harvard Business Review. So has mentioned in the chat, time management skills, making sure that you set aside the time to be curious, right? We are very, very busy individuals. We have a lot of layers to the onion in our lives, right? Um, so making sure you're setting aside that time, even if it's just 30 minutes each day, so you can look for some new research articles that meet your needs, get into the habit of asking why, why is that? Why did that happen? Why did she do that? Why did they do that? Why may help you lead down um, the trail of sparking your curious disposition. I recommend sharing ideas with colleagues or other students. Um, keep in mind that for those of you that are in the NU population here, you can utilize the comments, which is kind of one of our social, one of our internal platforms where people can chat with each other, discuss research topics, but there are other spaces to do that. And I know we have a handful of, of class-based students on here too. So um, little uh, spoiler alert, you will be getting access to the comments soon. Um, so thank you for your patience as uh, we have recently merged as two institutions and we're very happy to be able to provide that platform to all and you students, but you can always go to other professional platforms, right? So um, for example, I am interested in doing my research with adjunct faculty. So one of the things that I have done is gone on to adjunct faculty specific social media groups, just kind of hearing what's going on there. Like what's the pulse, what's the beat um, for those, those communities and what's the need? So, I'd like to invite you at this time, probably about 15, 20 seconds or so, just to write down something that maybe you feel will help with your curious disposition. And I know we have some faculty and staff in the room too, so maybe just thinking on 
what can you do to help try to spark your students' curious disposition so they can be more informed and um, have a, a, a better learning experience or a deeper learning experience as adult learners? I'll give you just a few moments for that. Oh, yes. And thank you so much. If you want to add these things in the chat, we welcome you to do that. That is always welcomed. Just a few more seconds and I'll move on to our next disposition. I hope I gave you a little something that might get you thinking about what else can you do as an adult learner. Okay, great. Moving on to self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is your belief that you can be successful when you need to complete a task. Situated in Bendora's social cognitive theory, self-efficacy is a personal construct that affects and is influenced by behaviors and social environmental variables. Self-efficacy, your perception of your own ability to achieve a goal. Self-efficacy, your belief in your capability to execute an action, sometimes described as task-specific self-confidence. So research has found that self-efficacy beliefs have consistently been shown to have both a direct and an indirect impact on a, academic performance. So that being said, <laughs> ideally, we want to support high self-efficacy because there is a correlation between your belief that you can achieve something and your academic achievement. Of course, we want to provide some strategies and we can discuss this as well at the end, but first it's story time. And I recommend to be on the lookout. There are many ways uh, that can improve uh, your self-efficacy, but I just want to share one story that might help you. It doesn't matter if you're doing your bachelor's program or your master's program or the doctoral program or a certificate or even your professional and personal career. I think one way that you can help provide or improve or boost your own self-efficacy is to be on the lookout. Be on the lookout for other positive role models. One thing I did at the beginning of my program was look at people who I admire and um and I value, and I would seek out those individuals and ask for, ask questions about my research topic, um, what they thought, I would discuss my potential problem statements, and I would ask for advice th and have throughout my program and will continue to do that. And I can say by taking that step, yes, it, you have to have some vulnerability to reach out to those people that you admire, but I can say by doing that is actually improve my self-efficacy. I believe through those encounters and conversations that I've become more informed, more knowledgeable, and more confident as a researcher. It doesn't have to be a professor. Uh, believe me, uh, there's plenty of positive role models I've turned to, like my friends, family, and coworkers at NU to help boost my self-efficacy. But I can say that being on the lookout for those positive role models has improved my own belief and my own perceptions that I can complete a challenging task. So again, increasing your self-efficacy and your perception that you can achieve difficult tasks as an adult learner can help transform your learning experience and increase your ability to feel positive about being able to tackle challenges along the way. There are several other ways that we can help improve our own self-efficacy. And I want to share some of those strategies and then um, hopefully um, provide some in the chat as well, too. Number one, set achievable goals. <laughs> one way you can do this is by breaking the task into smaller steps. So um, holy moly guacamole, if you are trying to write your review of lit, it is unbelievable when you are at the beginning of that process. So it can be overwhelming, right? So just get one little tiny puzzle piece of that huge puzzle and then keep put, popping them into place. Same thing for a capstone project in your master's program. 
you know, how am I going to get that 10 to 12 page paper done as an adult learner when I have to, the kid, when school is starting, the kids need help, the dog has to go to the vet, I'm taking care of my sick parent, you know, all of those pieces, you've got to break it down into something smaller and then keep adding to that puzzle until you get to your full picture. Visualize your success. Think about what might this look like when I'm done with this program? What are the possibilities that could happen for me? What kind of example am I showing my friends and family? How am I positively contributing to society? Positive self-talk. I can do this. I will do this. I am doing this. Even just saying it out loud can help transform how you go about doing it. We know the, the uh, effects, sometimes crippling effects that negative talk can do for ourselves. So let's make sure that we're injecting more positive self-talk into what we do, into how we do things, into what we can accomplish. That being said, as adult learners, it's important that we're focusing on how we can accept and learn from our failures. We're adult learners. By our very nature, that means that we're continuously learning and so are the people around us. It is okay to not get it right. What can we learn from that? And, and how can we make adjustments or changes so that we can, we can move on and improve our self-efficacy and that perception that even if something is challenging, you know what, I, will, I have learned from that in the past and here's how I'm going to do it different. I do want to show you just a laundry list of different uh, support systems at National University that could potentially help with your self-efficacy, also with your curiosity and the other two dispositions that we're going to talk about. I decided to slide it right in here. Of course, your professors at NU, your academic coaches in the Academic Success Center, there's one-on-one -on -one group sessions, your NU navigators in the Graduate Studies Support Center. They have just recently completed degrees at NU. They have walked the walk that you are doing now. Obviously, we all come from different walks of life and they fully respect that, but they're there to help be a mentor, help guide you. The NU librarians, if you have not set up a research consultation with the librarians yet, I highly recommend you do it. It will help your self-efficacy and your ability to be a skilled researcher at NU. Of course, your NU advisors there along the way throughout your journey. And then, of course, just be aware that we have timely care. So if you're stuck in a rut and you need some assistance with some wellness, don't hesitate to reach out to your support systems. Hey, Emily. Yes. I do have a couple questions in the chat. Yes. Um, the first is from Sherry, who wants okay. to know, um, what do you think people struggle with when trying to map out their goals? Okay. I think people, when people do map out their goals, this is just a personal opinion. I think a lot of it comes down to not being able to break it down into smaller pieces, right? My goal, for example, my goal. I'd like to complete my doctorate in education and organizational leadership. And I want to do that because of X, Y, Z. Well, I, I think when we have those big goals, sometimes we don't think about all the smaller pieces that we need to scaffold to that success, to that finish line. Um, so I hope that this puzzle piece picture helps you understand that those goals are great, right? The goal is that big picture, but try to break it down into smaller pieces so that you can get to that big picture. That That's just a personal opinion. I hope that helps. I would probably agree with you too. Um, I would say that's, that's probably one big thing, at least for me, um, you know, realizing you've got this big overarching goal, but what are the, you know, steps you've got to do to get there? Plus for me, starting anything is always the hardest. <laughs> Starting a paper, starting a test, yeah. starting to set my goals, all that's hard. <laughs> and I love that you said that too, Jenna, because earlier um, motivation came up, self-motivation. And so I think that's like the beginning, the start. Um, I see one other question in here about 
what should we set up with librarians? There are research consultations for those of you that are in your doctorate program or even for your master's degree. I'd also recommend it for your bachelor's program. So you learn how to navigate the library and you can have one-on-one -on -one sessions with librarians and they can teach you how to actually search for things in the NU library and maybe what might be the most useful search engines based off of your degree as well. Great. So um, I, I, see, I see Greg saying beginning is challenging for me. Yes, I agree with that. But maybe that's that thinking about that. What is the first step that you need to do to make sure that you have the beginning? Is it setting yourself a calendar reminder and saying, now is the time to start this? <laughs> is, it, is it writing it down on your to-do list for every week and then getting the satisfaction of checking it off the list? I'd like to, for giving you about 15 seconds or so, 20 seconds, so you can do some reflection on an action step that you'd like to take to, tr take, excuse me, to try to help you with your own self-efficacy. What is something you can do to try to improve that as an adult learner? Or um, maybe not even improve, but just, um, no, I'm gonna say improve. <laughs> I'll give you a moment to think about that. And we'll move on to our next disposition. And a lot of what we've talked about, right, with this motivation as well, too, is the ability to <laughs> persist, <laughs> persistence, right? The journey is long and hard and full of turns and twists and ups and downs. And persistence can get us across that finish line. Um, when I look at this beautiful garden, I see lots of turns, lots of twists. I'd probably need a boat. I didn't realize that there was water involved. It sure is pretty. Um, the adult learning journey might be a tad bit more messy than this, but I hope you get the idea of the twists and turns and potential roadblocks or obstacles that get in our way that we need to overcome. And persistence can help us get there. Um, continuing even when the task is difficult. And by the way, yes, persistence was key to me getting through statistics in case you're wondering. Um, that also goes for calculus. So sorry for my math, my math friends in here, but that was something that I absolutely needed to just keep on inching through, even though it was a difficult task for me. I think we can all agree that <laughs> I think we can all agree that this is a disposition we need to flex as adult learners. And maybe we need to flex it over and over and over again, because life doesn't stop moving when we're completing our studies. So oftentimes as adult learners, we have to overcome significant barriers in order to achieve our academic goals. And persistence is about two parts, as Cummings mentions intensity and duration. So what do we have to get done and how long is this going to take us? To spark your persistence, we have several support systems that I've already mentioned in the previous slide, but we're happy to include some of those links as well too, just to try to support you as adult learners in our follow-up email. I want to share a quick story uh, about what has helped me persist and then um, we can talk about some strategies as well, too. Lots of examples to choose from here, but I wanted to talk about accountability partner. Um, but technically, there's a, a typo here. I should have put an S, accountability partners, uh, because it turns out I have a laundry list of them. <laughs> but um, I feel like having someone who can help you say, hey, uh, you need to get back to this or, Hey, how's that? How's the degree coming? Or, Hey, how can I help you? Um, is there anything I can do to help you along this journey? That has actually helped my, pers my, uh, persistence because as I've mentioned before, we all have busy lives as adult learners, right? We've got, I got, maybe we've got kids in school or we're taking care of a family member, or we have an incredible pile of things that we have to get done in our own professional careers. So again, keep in mind, we have additional support here at NU, but I do have accountability partners that I lean on, or maybe they give me a gentle nudge at times to help me persist. First one I'm going to share is, is my husband. 
Uh, he knows how hard this journey is. He's completed the, a degree himself as an adult learner. And when I, he knows again, how hard this is. When I need to get something done for my, my doctorate program, he's there to support me so that I can help persist in my journey, right? Because otherwise I'm going to come up with every other excuse <laughs> to not get into that research paper that day because I would rather spend time with my children. But I know that again, as we mentioned before, that big goal item, I know that that big goal item, there's little tiny pieces to that puzzle. And a part of that is relying on my accountability partner or partners, I should say, as Jenna is in the room, she's certainly one of them. Um, I do want to say too, it doesn't necessarily have to be a human as an accountability partner. It could be some sh something that's like a visualization to help you persist and help that disposition. And that actually comes from one thing that I'll share with you it comes from my mom and dad. And it's this, it's this birthday card. It's just a birthday card, just a normal birthday card. I got it in July of of 2021 and I read it and I'm not going to read it now because it'll just make me all teary eyed. So I'm not going to do that, but it gives me that spark of, I can do this. I, I, I am capable to do this. I am going to get this done. And it, it's a visualization that helps, helps me when I'm tired or I'm, ex you know, can't look up one more research article. And I have this card out on top of my desk and it helps remind me Hey, you've got this. Persist. Nevertheless, she persisted and move forward and get that get that assignment done because you're growing as an adult learner and I am I am empowering myself to do good things in my community as a result of this degree. And I very much so look forward to that. Um, there's a lot of people in this room here that have been my accountability partners too, so I'd like to give a gentle nod to them as well. But I hope through connections that you make in your own community that when times feel like, oh gosh, I really could use a little spark here, you have someone to lean on. And if you do not, I am going to give you some other strategies as well too. For example, building connections, again, through the Commons platform, but I'd also like to give a shout out to the Advanced Research Center. Maybe you're trying to connect with other scholars in the field, other researchers that are interested in your research. That's a great space where you can go and learn about what other, other people are trying to do to get themselves out in the research community. Your own National University LinkedIn profile, right? So you could use that as a professional capacity to build connections. Leaning in on your community, your colleagues, friends, and family, right? Um, also, hey, um, my dog Cooper, he's a great accountability partner. He has been right here by my side this entire time and has been a great support system. And so keep in mind, it comes, those connections can come in all sorts of varied shapes and sizes, human and fur babies alike. Keep that growth mindset so you can persist. Stay flexible, right? As adult learners, we need to know that we could pivot on a dime if we need to. The visual reminders, even a little sticky note to yourself, reminding yourself why you're doing what you're doing and why it matters. Celebrate the small wins. Yes, celebrate the small wins. Awesome. You found two resources for your research paper? Fabulous. Congratulations. No, seriously. Congratulations. You finished that paragraph for that research paper that you needed to turn in by 11.45 p.m. at night. Great job. Celebrate the win. I'd like you to take about maybe 15, 20 seconds so you can think about that action step that you'd like to help increase persistence. And again, if you're a faculty or staff position, you're welcome to think about that and how you can help your adult learners persist in the online classroom space. I'll just wait just a few seconds while you have a moment to reflect. Okay, let me move forward. Absolutely, of course. To reflection. <laughs> 
This is such an important disposition, I feel, as just a human being, but as an adult learner, as researchers and students, engaging in reflection can help us with so many aspects of learning. When we stop and reflect and think what happened, why it happened, when it happened, how it happened, who it happened to, that might increase our learning from a superficial space to a deeper learning experience. Reflection can lead to meaningful learning and to change. And as Donald Sean highlights, the importance of fostering reflection about what happens and why it happens, personal beliefs feelings, errors, gaps, and possible variables in order to achieve meaningful learning can occur through reflection. And uh, I'd like to, I'd like to um, give props. I mean, I've used reflection many times in my life, but not as a qualitative researcher in the way that Dr. Linda Bloomberg introduced reflexive practices to me. Quite some time ago, many years ago, she said, it's time to journal. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you, Dr. Bloomberg, for introducing it to me as a qualitative researcher. You know, at first when she had mentioned, I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be time consuming. I'm not going to lie. Yes, it is. It is time consuming. Um, because... I, I don't know about other learners in the space, but for me, typing is much faster than writing. And, um, but that being said, writing down my thoughts throughout this journey over the last couple of years has absolutely um, helped me with a deeper and more meaningful learning experience, right? Because I want to be the expert in my particular topic. And so through journaling, through these reflexive practices that I am engaging in, it has actually helped me have a more meaningful experience as an adult learner. It's also been a great space to talk about my frustrations or challenges along the way too, and in a space where I can learn and grow from that as well. Um, I've also had lots of life that has happened and also death that has happened in my family throughout my journey. And it has been a very great space for me to be able to kind of capture those moments throughout my adult learning experience. And it's helped me process things. And so I really hope that, um, I, I know that data and analysis is on its way, coming, coming to Emily Springer soon. So I know that the journaling process will also help with that because it will help me understand what am I doing? When did I do it? What do I think about it? And what am I going to do about it? I hope it's an effective tool for you. I'm just going to share a few more strategies for reflection. Create a schedule. I know someone mentioned like starting is the hardest uh, process. Maybe you have a schedule every week where you do some sort of reflection at the end of your assignment. You just take 10 minutes just thinking about what you learned that week, what you need to, maybe what you need moving forward. That schedule should help, help guide you and keep your reflection in a positive space and a useful space. Guess what? create a system that works for you. This journal works for me. It might not work for you. You might prefer to use a Word document. You might prefer to use a, an audio recorder, right? So that you can listen back to your thoughts, talk it out loud, hear it back in, through the audio. So do something that does work for you. And then this one I would say is probably the most challenging strategy as an adult learner, pause and absorb. Pause, hmm. That's hard. <laughs> um, I would recommend one thing that I did for research articles that I was getting into and needing to read for whatever it was throughout the last several years, especially in the beginning. To be honest, I had a hard time understanding parts of those research articles. I hope other people in the room feel the same way. But one thing that I did do is I would read it. I would just like sit with it for a second. Then if there was a part that I didn't un clearly understand, I would read that part again. And then I would write something down from that part to try to absorb the material and create a deeper reflection on what I had just read. 
to learn and grow as an adult learner. I'd like to give you about 15 seconds at this time to think about an action step you'd like to take to help increase your reflective practices. Again, I know we have both student and staff and faculty in the room. So think about it from whatever lens you need to at this moment. And I'll give you about 15 seconds or so. I am going to invite you to share some goodies with us. Share any highlight thought that you pulled from today. You're welcome to do that in the chat. We can read them aloud. We can also um, have them come up in the Q&A as well. While you're thinking about mustering up, um, I know Jenna, you can help facilitate that for me. Um, but sharing an idea of maybe a disposition that you heard today that you want to focus on moving forward. I'm just going to quickly show my very important but less jazzy reference slide so that you can see all the references used in today's session. And then of course that'll be captured in the recording. But just because the candy looks so good, I'm going to flip back and we'll see if anyone wants to share anything. Someone had mentioned, are there spaces to connect with uh, students in person? And I absolutely want to encourage you to go to one of my accountability partners, Dr. Samira Galveo. She runs Power Hours, in-person Power Hours, and she is absolutely fabulous. So if you're looking to connect with NU students face-to-face -face in Zoom, we welcome you to take a look at those power hours and I will happily include a link to those sessions in my follow-up email. I see lots of good talk about anything you want to discuss, Jenna, that has popped up in the chat that you think we should discuss before closing today. No, I think we are good. I don't have any other questions. I hope these dispositions, this this curious nature, your self-efficacy, your persistence, and your reflection helps transform your adult learning experience. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And I will pass this over to Jenna to close. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Emily. Really appreciate your time today. Um, I thought that it was a great presentation. And of course, as a reminder, I want everyone to know that we're going to be posting this video, the recording in our um, Graduate Study Support Center Skill Up page. So thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time.